And that goes again to with this whole Chrislam thing and, and laying a foundation for a one world religion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now people are sort of attacking Ben Carson and really just focusing on him saying one particular thing uh, where you have a secular Muslim woman speaking out saying Ben Carson has a point and he might be right. We'll talk a little bit more about that coming up in the next segment as well. We're going to be taking a few more of your phone calls before Jakari Jackson joins me in studio to wrap up his experience there in Philly with the big lockdown for the Pope's visit. Oh, my goodness. That's all coming right up. All right. Welcome back to the fourth hour overdrive of the Alex Jones Show. I am Leanne McAdoo. If you want to watch this, be sure to go to Infowars.com forward slash show and you can see everything that we're talking about. Uh, stream it live with us. Now, Kit Daniels is still in studio with me and I wanted to talk about uh, a tweet that David Knight sent out. David Knight, uh, obviously there with Shakari Jackson, has been covering uh, the Pope's visit to the United States and he sent out a tweet. Uh, there was a big sign there behind the Pope, and it says, transformational leaders are Jesuit educated. And it had a big pic picture there of the Pope. And to me, that was, and I obviously to David Knight as well, that was pretty um, impressive, I guess, that they would single out an order like that, that they would single out one group like that. Yeah, and it's basically them admit admitting that we're transforming the Catholic Church, you know, through right. Jesuism, which is exactly what the Pope's doing right now. Yeah, transformational leaders, which obviously this word transformation is going to be one of those key buzzwords in the whole Agenda 21 plan. Uh, because if you go to the Sustainable Development Program there on the United Nations page, it says transforming our world, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So it, it is Just give it time. They're it's all start about transformation. Sustainable Christianity, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and and that this is the this is the big push for the one world religion, one world government. Um, we're starting to see that here. Now, I want to go to one of our callers. I'm going to go to Craig in Michigan and uh, go ahead, Craig. Hi. Uh, yes, I was watching the uh, Philly Pope show on Saturday night on CNN. And during the Frey concert, the Jumbotron behind, behind the band, band started showing what appeared to be an image of Baphomet. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I just emailed that to um, Kit Daniels, the picture that came off of the World Meeting of Families 2015 website. Okay. And it shows up there as well. Wow. No, yeah, I didn't I didn't see that myself, but uh, Kit, Kit said he's definitely going to check that out. But I mean, that just ties into what you were saying. Yeah, I mean, it's like what we see Thank now you, Craig. is the fact that they're pushing through the Pope. They're pushing all this government initiatives, more regulations, bigger government, you know, the climate change myth, so on and so forth. Because they want to replace Christianity with worship the state, where God is the state. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the the elites that want to look, that want the uh, population to see themselves at God, you know, of course, most of them, mass, mass majority of them, if not all of them, kind of worship Lucifer. So they feel like they're empowered by Lucifer to uh, take over the Catholic Church and then kind of replace the Christian teachings with those of the state. Well, and that's why, for me, it, it is just so sort of shocking here being working at InfoWars, so I can kind of see behind the curtain a little bit. But that's that's what they don't want you to to really recognize is, is that there is this huge push. Why would you be so anti-Christianity, attacking Christianity, and then at the same time really promoting another religion that in some cases is much more extreme, depending on you know how <laughs> how far you want to take it. Some some Muslim people say that they don't agree with all the tenets of Islam and Sharia law, but. A lot do. Well, I'll, go, so on, I'll go on this. a stretch. I haven't looked at it completely, so I'm kind of speculating here. But I do have a feeling that Islam fits a lot better into uh, government power structure as far as kind of, uh, you know, you see kind of the most, uh, you know, the most devout Islamic countries in the Middle East are also have probably the, the largest governments or the most uh, powerful governments. But on the other hand, you see Christianity is more for the most part, for through the history, especially in the United States, it's been this more rebellious, you know, we're not going to follow the government, you know, without questioning it. We're going to follow our beliefs first. Right. So there's more of a 
So I think that's one of the reasons why they're pushing uh, Islam over Christianity in that aspect. And I, and, and I kind of agree with that as well. Also, you know, you hear globally that Islam is one of the fastest growing religions. Um, so, you know, you see, they always say that empires always fall. And so the people who are sort of controlling this empire, they know this. This has happened throughout history. So what are you going to do? latch on to the next largest growing religion so you can continue to control the population, merge the two large religions. We've seen that happen so many times throughout history. Well, they, well uh, they'll go in and take over a group and then assimilate some of their beliefs and, and some of the things that they're, which is why people can say that there's some sort of pagan um, rituals and things like that that fall in with Christianity and things because that's how they're able to assimilate the group that they conquer mm -hmm. is by allowing them to sort of have their little religious things here and there. But, you know, while while transforming them entirely and, uh, you know, but slowly not letting them know it. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. It's kind of it's frightening, but it's also a very exciting time to be alive. Uh, you know, but Islam, they they struggle with it's if, if it's really compatible with democracy and uh, secularism. So, you know, that's why we don't want a president there that's going to. Uh, uphold Sharia law. Welcome back to the fourth hour of the Alex Jones Show. This is Overdrive with Leanne McAdoo. If you want to watch along with us, go to infowars.com forward slash show. Now, I was just brought this article. Uh, this is from CNBC. Angela Merkel caught on hot mic griping to Facebook CEO over anti-immigrant posts. Wow. Now, what they caught on this hot mic was the Facebook CEO overheard responding that, yeah, we do need to do some work on that. So basically, Angela Merkel asks him in English, are you working on this? And he says affirmative that he is trying to curtail anti-immigrant posts about the refugee crisis. And, and that's exactly what we told you last week when Kit Daniels article was on, uh, was not we weren't able to post it on Facebook. It was being censored, and of course, that was Pope Kid amnesty activist stage PR stunt to promote illegal immigration. So there you have it: Facebook actively working to censor your news. And don't you feel comfortable knowing that they are going to be now the largest news aggregator in the world? So I'm and sure they've been we're doing be this the before. Truth. You know, it's not Kari always Jackson the, joining me in studio. Yeah, it's not always <laughs> the uh, the Im immigrants. You know, we've heard reports of gun stuff to try to put guns in the same category as porn and many other things as well. And then we're no stranger to censorship, whether it's on Facebook or other platforms. Yeah, and it's just, it's all part of this whole, you know, the new agenda, the new takeover. Facebook is trying to get all media outlets out there to have to filter their news through Facebook. So they're going to be controlling all of the information that you are receiving. Now, it'll be very interesting to see how they're going to spin this story. A lot of people are kind of uh, confused about this. I want to play this report that you did while you were there in Philly. Uh, the Pope claims Jesus failed on the cross. So let's go ahead and play that report. Jakari Jackson for InfoWars.com reporting in Philadelphia. This is the last day of the Pope's visit. Now, since he's been here, he's said and done a lot of things. But the thing that stuck out to me the most is something he said during, I guess it was a mass, where he came out and said that, the life of Jesus ultimately ended in failure, in the failure on the cross. I have the transcript here. This is reported by ABC News, and it says in part, The cross shows us a different way of measuring success. Ours is to plant the seed. God sees the fruit of our labors, and if at times our efforts and work seem to fail and not produce fruit, we need to remember that we are followers of Jesus Christ and his life, humanly speaking, ended in failure, the failure of the cross. Then he went on to talk about the dangers of being uh, comfortable with uh, surroundings and things such as that, which is a whole nother topic in and of itself. But he says the failure of Jesus, the failure of the cross, even though the Bible clearly states that Jesus knew what was going to happen to him, as uh, far as the cross was concerned, how he is going to lay his life down. He even said, Lord, if it is your will, take this bitter cup from me, but not your will, but not my will, your will be done. And particularly, we know this when we look at John 17 and 18. Therefore doth my father love me, because I laid my life down, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. Which is to say, nobody took his life from him on the cross. He laid it down willingly he knew what was going to happen to him so to say that his life in general the cross in particular 
was a failure is something I'm very disappointed to see from a supposed spiritual leader. And there are many other things I could talk about as far as the Pope, but this is something, a glaring thing that stuck out to me. So anybody who claims to be a follower of Christ, uh, I'm surprised if they're not as shocked and appalled by this as I am. I found it to be very disturbing and a very sour note to have while he was here in the United States of America. You can find more reports on InfoWars.com. Well, Jakari, very nice reporting there. So this kind of ties back to an earlier caller who said she thought people were interpreting this, misinterpreting what the Pope had to say. She said, even Jesus said, why hast thou forsaken me? It's talking about how he did fail or as a human, that was a failure. So well, I, know I disagree with that you're, statement. You're a Christian outspoken. So, I mean, what do you think about what the Pope said? Well, just like I said in the report, it was very... Uh, Bizarre and downright uh, uh, disheartening to hear somebody of that stature refer to uh, Jesus's life as a failure. In, in the complete quote, which I read there in the piece, he said, humanly speaking, Jesus failed, but I don't consider his life to be a failure at all, especially not what he did on the cross. Because, you know, he said, not your will, I mean, excuse me, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, when he was talking to God before he was to be crucified, you know, we uh, referenced some other scriptures there in the report that we just played. So I don't consider Jesus's life to be a uh, failure at all. And more on that, uh, we had a caller who called in earlier, and if you guys get this clip ready, referring to some statements that the Pope made at the UN, I believe it was, and uh, we'll just play this clip, and then we'll comment after that. Señor Presidente. Mr. President. Señoras. Ladies, señores, and gentlemen, buenos días. Una vez más, siguiendo una tradición de la que me siento honrado, el Secretario General de las Naciones Unidas ha invitado al Papa a dirigirse a esta honorable Asamblea de las Naciones. En nombre propio y en el de toda la comunidad católica, señor Ban Ki-moon, quiero expresarle el más sincero y cordial agradecimiento. So basically what you just heard the Pope say there is what the caller was referring to earlier when he said, I come in my own name. Mm. And you're supposed to come in the name of God, not, you know, so I, I can't go and do good works. And so like, yeah, it, this is, you know, Chikara Jackson, I'm the greatest, most awesome guy <laughs> on the planet. You know, you're supposed to come, you know, when you do something uh, spiritual, you're supposed to give the glory basically to God. So that's what our caller was referring to uh, when that earlier segment, when he brought that up. And I think that's a very good find. Many people are, you know, they're looking at all these things now because a lot of times uh, people like me who don't speak uh, multiple languages, they have to wait for these transcripts to come out. And just like when I did the report talking about uh, Jesus uh, failing on the cross in the Pope's opinion. I waited a couple of days, you know, trying to see if somebody debunked it, if there was another translation out there. But, you know, everybody was pretty much content with the translation that was out there. So I said, well, this is what this guy said. I definitely find an issue with the way that he presented Christ, especially as uh, the supposed figure of the church. Right, that, that, that's the, you know, you're supposed to be the head of Christianity and now you're trying to talk about uh, take out the value of what happened on the cross. I mean, that's like a one of the foundations of Christianity. The I mean, ultimate like, sacrifice. You, you understand people wear crosses around their necks. They don't wear Pope mobiles around <laughs> their necks. They they wear the cross. The cross has a huge significance in Christianity. Right. Well, hmm, that's a very interesting take. Now, switching gears a little bit, Jakari, it seems like wherever we send you, some sort of a lockdown happens, like riot here. How does here. that happen? I mean, um, you're you're just like that magic element. You know, it's like <laughs> you know, if you would ask me when I was in high school, if every place I went was going to turn to lockdown, I was like, you know, that's that's ridiculous. But <laughs> yeah, whether it's uh, Baltimore, Ferguson, uh, recently Washington, New York City, and Philadelphia, where I just came from this morning, a uh, complete lockdown. And the thing interesting about this, I was talking to Biggs about this earlier. When we went to Ferguson, they locked down a section of town. When we went to Baltimore, they had a citywide curfew, but they locked down a section of town. Same thing in New York, and which was a relatively small area, all things considered, and also in Washington, D.C. But when we went to Philadelphia, they pretty much locked down downtown Philadelphia. To anybody who hasn't seen our reports over the weekend, David Knight and myself, we arrived on a train 
uh, in the evening uh, this past weekend, and they had the taxi service suspended. They had the National Guard greet us. They said, hey, there's going to be no taxi service in this area. So we're like, oh, crap, can we walk at least? It's like, yeah. So we start walking. They have bridges shut down. They have 